apart from Roger. But I think I know how to work his laptop. Ah, not everyone's back. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, like a lot of you, most of you, this is my first Geostat meeting. Um, I, I feel I was almost pulled on a long string to get here because um, I was just busy with other stuff and I wasn't sure what I was going to do. Um, but just to introduce myself, this, uh, I can figure out Roger's laptop, there we go, that was me and that was me as well. And this is me now. Um, I work at Lancaster University in the School of Health and Medicine. Uh, now the Faculty of Health and Medicine. I work in the medical school part of that. I do statistical epidemiology research, mapping diseases, um, analyzing disease data, writing programs to fit disease models and stuff like that. And our little group is called CHICAS, uh, Health Information Computation Statistics. And if you want to go to our website, you can look for us. You can find out the sort of stuff we do. Um, so we've got a list of little projects. Uh, the latest thing I've been doing has actually not been spatial at all. It's been predicting emergency admissions to hospital and producing a nice little web graph for the people at the hospital to see what their uh, hospital admissions are going to be. But um, in the past, I've done several other jobs on... Uh, meningitis forecasting in Africa. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that was one of mine. Uh, the space-time partial likelihood stuff I've worked on a bit, and so on. Uh, you can find out more about me on my personal website. Obviously, links to all these things will be made available. So, as I said, I was I was kind of press ganged into a, a, to coming here, and I couldn't think what to what to talk about because. Roger has obviously been talking about the vector stuff and Robert's talking about the raster stuff and there isn't anything else to talk about. Everyone's going to be talking about all their wonderful R packages and stuff. So I kind of thought, well, let's, let's, talk about, let's not talk about R. I, mean, I spend most of my time using R, um, but I, I'm, I use a lot of other things as well. So I thought, let's talk about the no R way of, of geospatial data. And luckily, we're not in Sweden <laughs> this year. Or uh, it's the only country that I could do this pun, so I'm, I don't have to come back again now I've done this. Um, there, there are a lot of tools out there for geospatial data, and using R does have this sort of stigma of, of the command line and being hard to learn and, and the learning curves and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so some of you might not go on to be hardcore statisticians writing models fitting in R. You might just end up wanting to produce some pretty maps maybe doing a little bit of analysis. So it's, it's a good idea to know what else is out there for doing maps with spatial data. Um, I have a kind of list of requirements for things for people who want to do a little workshop session tomorrow. Uh, I'll, I'll come to some of those in, in a minute, uh, perhaps at the end. But don't worry if you've only got a Windows machine. Uh, we can get the tools working on Windows or on Macs. Let's look at the logos. I see a Mac. I see no other Macs. Obviously, I can't. There's one there, perhaps, with a sticker. And I can't tell what other operating systems people are running. Let's have a quick show of hands. On your laptop, who is running Windows 7? Loads, 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 loads. Anyone running anything less than Windows 7? Anyone on... What are you on, sir? Windows Vista? OK. Uh, anyone running Linux? Various flavors, I guess, Ubuntu, Mint, Debian, and a couple of Macs. OK, it's kind of nice to know. But everything else we can install, everything we can install cross-platform, and I can get, we can get the Unix tools for everything else. All my notes and everything uh, are on GitHub. Um, this actual presentation is being hosted on GitHub, so if the network goes down, we'll lose it. So we're in, it's in three parts. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to show you where I live. And this is where I have to drive 
Roger's laptop. Gosh, I just, I just want to, just want to get that. Okay, I just want to show you where I live. This is, this is where I live. Okay, I live in, in the, the terminal. <laughs> I, I, I see sometimes talks of people on, uh, online, and they come and say, "Hi, I'm John. I'm from the internet." Um, I'm from I'm from the Shell Prompt. Okay, I kind of live there. I do everything from from here. Okay, so if I if I want to run R, I type R at the Shell Prompt. I don't find a menu and go R Studio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If I want to run, I want to get out of that. Uh, say that. If I want to run my editor, huh, I run Emacs. Roger doesn't use Emacs, so. I would probably go, oh, well, Roger, I've got to edit my file somehow. I'll use... Oh, you haven't got Nano. Got anything. Right. So, Roger uses this editor called VI, and I now cannot remember how to quit. Escape. <laughs> colon. Colon. Q. Bang. Yes. Okay, so I, I do everything from the command line. I can list my files. I can remove everything, all my files... <laughs> and so on. But there's a lot else you can do from the Unix shell. So the first part of the talk, uh, which I've got 15 minutes for, is just a little talk on Unix shell program, which you can do on Windows with a, a Unix shell emulation for Windows. So let's I tell a little story. I get to work one morning, and there's an email from well-known fictional uh, marine biologist Rebecca Davis saying, hey, Barry. Here's that sea otter tracking data set, Rebecca. And there's an attachment, otter.gen. What do you do with that file? What do you do when you get a file you don't really know about? Open it up in Notepad. Anything else? Sorry? Search the internet for what a .gen file is. Yep, in this case, it doesn't really help because there's so many .gen files and everyone seems to think... Okay, you, you could send an email to Rebecca saying, what the hell's this? <laughs> so I fictionally did. Nicely. What file format is that, Rebecca? Rebecca comes back with an out of the office. I'm in Antarctica for the next six months <laughs> without internet connection. Because that's obviously the last thing she did before she got on the plane. Okay, so this is my list of things that sometimes people do when they get an unknown file. Double click it and hope. Windows cannot find an application for this file. They might load it into Excel. They might load it into Word. It's data. You can, Excel's got to load data. That's what it's for. Or search for the extension on the internet and see what it is. Well, that's not what I do because I live in the command line. The first thing I do is I run file on it. Um, I hope this text isn't too small. I can possibly try and big it up. Ooh, that's gone the wrong way. That's too big. Okay, I may have to give up on... Where's the minus sign? <laughs> yeah, how's that? <laughs> Reset. Uh -huh, there we go. Okay, if I just go to full screen, you'll see it a bit better, I hope. Okay, and I've gone back up a page. So there's a, a file command. I sit there at, com at the command line type, file otter.gen. <coughs> it tells me what it is. Now, file is quite smart. It recognizes all sorts of file names. Um, but it also looks into the file itself to see what kind of data is in there. So it can recognize compressed zip files and stuff like that. And it's telling me this is ASCII text. And ASCII is, is an abbreviation for plain text with a particular way of encoding it, something that's just... Us old guys will know about, but youngsters have probably never seen a text file in their lives. The next thing I might do is just see how big this file is by listing, doing a long listing of the file properties, and that 2341 is the number of characters in that file. The way the Unix command line works is you give it a command and you give it a bunch of arguments, and the sort of modifying arguments are normally with dashes, so minus L is a long listing, otherwise I'd just get the file name. If I put minus LH, I get what's called a human-readable size for humans who understand what 2.3K means. 
So that's you know, roughly 2.3 thousand characters in size. Another useful little uh, thing, once I know that this is a text file, is just to count how many words and lines and characters are in there. So I can quickly see there's 130 lines, 251 words, things divided by spaces, and 2,341 characters, which is the same number as I got up there. So that's just a little exercise on the side. This is intentionally a small file because I'm going to show you it kind of in its entirety. But if someone sends you a bigger file, these things might be a bit more useful. So the next thing I do now, I know this is a plain text file and it's not going to mess up my terminal, is just look at the first few lines. And for that, Unix has the head function, which is, or the head command, which is similar to the head function in R, which we've seen already to look at the first few rows of a data frame. In this case, we get the first 10 lines of the file. And it starts with a 1, and then it's got some coordinates. And similarly as in R, I can do tail minus 5 and get the last five lines. And in this case, I've got some coordinates and a couple of end things. So what are these end things going? Rebecca's in Antarctica. She can't tell me what's, what's going on here. So let's have a look at the whole file. Now, you can send the file to the terminal and it will whiz up off the screen without you having a chance to have a good look at it. So Unix has what's called a pager called more. It's called more because it gives you a page and then says more, at which point you hit the space bar for the next page or you hit Q to quit and so on. You can go backwards and forwards. There's another pager called less, which is like more but has more functions, ironically because we geeks love irony. <laughs> uh, we hate irony. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you're laughing ironically. Or, or I... OK, so now I can, I can see a bit more of the structure of the file. Um, it appears to be a number, some coordinates, an end, a number, some coordinates, and so forth. So what are those ends doing in there? How many of them are there? What are, they, what are they all about? There's the grep command, which in any sensible language will be called find or search or something, but this is Unix. Um, I, I think it's something like global replace, or even though it doesn't do replacing, it's, it's just searching. But hmm? Brilliant. Um, I'll ask you what something else means in a minute and you start telling me. So let's see where those end markers are in the file. I just grep end otter.gen and this is case sensitive so I have to put end in uppercase. And there's four of them sitting there. And then another modifier to grep minus n will tell me what line they're on. So 33, 89, 128, 129. Now the other useful thing you can do on the Unix command line is filter the output from one command into another. So if I take that grep, which produces these four lines, pipe it using this bar pipe, come up, pipe character into word count minus line, it tells me there's four of them. Sure, I can count four easy enough. Been doing that since I was three. So now three and a half, five, six, I don't know, I can't count. Um, for a large file, it's easy enough to see how many, how many instances of any particular word have I got in this file, just with that one line on the command line. Um, and I do often use it for filtering really huge files. I've got a text file of all the postcodes in the United Kingdom, of which there are several hundred thousand, but mostly I only care about the area I'm working in, which in this case might be the LA1 region. So I can search for all the postcodes that start with LA1, and put them in a file called la1codes.txt. Now here I've used a redirection symbol there, that greater than sign, which instead of sending, sending the output to the screen, sends it to another file. And there's a little hat there, which is the marker for the start of a line. So any lines in that file that start with la1 are now in my subset file. And once you know a few more Unix commands, you can build complicated pipes like this. Suppose I've got some case data for the whole country, I only want those that are in LA1, and that's the first record in the, in the file. I want to make everything uppercase, and then I want to fix a couple of typos where someone spelt female wrong, then find all the female data 
and send it to another file, clean, uppercase, female.txt. So I can do that with one line. That's a one-liner. Um, and it does it a line at a time in the input file. So it can work on as big a file as you've got without running out of memory. Very economical on memory. Um, and once I've done that, for example, this is a slightly different input file. There's a sort function, sort command. In this case, it doesn't work a line-by-line -line basis because it has to take all the input in to sort it and then spit it out in uh, sorted order. And then I can send that into another Unix command called unique minus C, which counts the number of unique lines um, in order as we go. So I've got one misspelt female record from LA1, and then there are two correctly spelt female records from LA1, and so on down to LA2, uh, and there's a misspelt male record. So you can build these, these chains and pipes. And you can even do something similar to a database join. If you've got two sorted files and you've got a field in them, in this case the postcode area field here, this first field, uh, if you've got a matching field, then it's a Unix command line one-liner to join the postcodes to the individual data. So that one-liner will produce an output where I've got, now got the postcode of each of my cases uh, with the coordinates taken from the postcode file. And that join is about as complicated a database operation as I've ever done on a database. And this is the sort of stuff I was doing 20-something years ago when R was rubbish and S plus was expensive and ARC info was unusable. So we shipped everything out into text files and built these great Unix pipelines. So let's look at our Otter data again. So we've got this hypothesis of what this file is, is looking like. We think it's an ID number, then some latitude-longitude pairs of the track, and then an end mark, and then there's another end mark at the end. This is another handy little Unix utility, and I'm going to ask you what do you think AUK stands for? K is Koenigan. Uh, Aho. Aho is the A. Weinberger. Weinberger is the W. Aho, Weinberger, and Koenigan, who are the three guys who wrote it and who wrote a lot of Unix. Um, it's a text file stream processing language, which mostly doesn't look like any language you've ever seen before. But it's a, a small programming language, a, a domain-specific programming language for text file handling. And each line of the language is of the form pattern and then action in curly brackets. And what it does, it takes each line of the input file and applies every line of the language. So if the pattern matches, do the action. If the next pattern matches, do the action. And the patterns can refer to the structure of the file. So for example, nf is a variable which matches the number of fields separated by spaces in the file. So this is a very simple, perhaps the simplest sort of awk program, just in those quotes. <laughs> if the number of fields are not equal to two, there's no, pat there's no action in curly brackets, so you get the default action, which is to print the line. So what will happen here is it just will print every line where there's not two fields. So that just gives us one, end, two, end, three, end, end. It's stripped out all the coordinates, we now know that there's only these records that probably aren't coordinates. Awk scripts can get um, complicated. Um, I don't expect you to understand a lot of these things or be able to type them in shortly afterwards, but just as conceptual examples of what these things can do, what I'm going to do here is if ever the second coordinate, $2 is the second field in our, so that's the first coordinate, no, it's the second coordinate, because they're x, y. The, if the second coordinate number is bigger than 60.64, might, that might be some significant value, print out the record number, which is the line number in the file, print out a little message, and then print the coordinates, print the line out. So you can do you know, complicated pattern matching and printing like that. Uh, another little example of awk. When we look at where the ends are in our file, we can figure out how many points are before each each end. So obviously the first um, the first track has got 
because the end is on line 33. There's one for the ID at the start, so that gives us 31 points coordinates in there. So by subtracting these numbers, we can work out how many coordinates are in each line. And we can do that with an awk script with two rules. Uh, one that sort of resets everything to zero at the start, and then another rule that just subtracts the line when we find an end. Um, look for the, uh, so look for the, this is going to be the input. And so that's grep for end otter.gen, pipe it into awk, and then we're just going to take the previous first value from the last first value and print that out. And you get something approximating to the difference between well, initially with zero from those things. Um, so there's a bit of maths you can do in it. And you can get really complicated. For example, this is a, a complete script which you feed into awk via a minus f. And what this does is it actually works out the path length for each of the tracks. So when it finds an ID at the start, which is where there's only one field, it starts the distance off at zero. And then whenever there's a coordinate, it adds on the extra bit of distance to the next coordinate or from the previous coordinate. And when it finds an end marker, it prints out the output. And if you run that on that otter file, um, you get out the simple Pythagoras rule path length of each of those three tracks that we know are in there. Oh, an email arrived. Rebecca's checking her email before she gets on the plane to the South Pole, right? And she tells us the data is in ArcInfo ungenerate format. Of course, GEN for ungenerate files. Here's the full set of 38 track files, which she's, she's discovered on her laptop. So now I've got 38 of these things. And you can see they're named otter-yearmonthday.gen. Uh, and that's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Um, anyway, we now know they're in a standard format. And we can read those straight into QGIS. We can read them straight into R with read OGR. Um, and you can see these are fake data of otters swimming around Alaska. This is the one place I've done field work. I stayed, I think, there. The nearest town is off the map that way somewhere. And uh, so I thought, well, let's just make some fake otter tracks running around. So anyway, we can load that file straight in. This is the, one of the first ones, and this is the ID value of the otter, and I've colored the, the tracks there. Uh, the otter I've loaded in another one just to check that the second one loads in, and those are the white lines underneath. So these, these guys are swimming around merrily. Great. Um, but again, command line. The way that the RGDL, rgoodle package works is by linking in the Google and OGR code that's written in C and C++. And there are Unix command line commands that also link into those C and C++ utilities for getting information out. So I can run OGR info on otter.gen, and you can do this on shape files, um, GML files, any spatial data. You just run OGR info, and it will, if it understands it, spit out the basic information of what layers are in the data. With a bit more persuasion, it will tell you what, how many features are in there, what the bounding box is, whether there's a coordinate system on it or not. And I think with the next slide, slightly different options again. This time, I don't want a summary of the layers. I just want everything you know about the layers. It now tells me that this, the first feature in the file is a linear feature with these coordinates. I've just omitted a bit there. The second feature is another linear feature with that, those coordinates. So I can get out all the information onto the screen of any spatial data. And clearly, I can do things like grep for ID or grep for line string or grep to see if there's a coordinate system or stuff like that. The thing that worries me about these ungenerate files is they don't have a coordinate system. Um, I'll assume until Rebecca gets back from Antarctica that these are EPSG4326. What's that in longhand, Robert? Is it plus long, plus, plus this, plus that. I'll just use the shorthand. But 
there's one of these good OGR command lines for converting from one particular OGR standard format to another. OGR to OGR. Convert a shapefile to an ungenerate. Convert a generate to a shapefile. Convert a GML to this, that. So I tell it that my source um, spatial reference system is 4326. My target spatial reference system is also 4326. But I'm going to write a shapefile which actually supports that projection being stored in it. So it takes that otter.gen with all those numbers in and produces for me a shapefile. Yeah, do you have to write the target uh, projection? I don't know, I'm kind of being explicit. Maybe it will take it as a default or take it because I've told it that the origin is yeah. that. Um, so now I can just get run OGR info on my shapefile and it tells me the extent and then it tells me all the the components of the uh, coordinate reference system which uh, Robert likes to spell out in full. I don't know how many decimal places he goes to with his, <laughs> with his radius. Um, great. But I've got 38 of these files now, however many it was. So I want to run OGR to OGR for all of these generate files to create a whole bunch of shape files. So it's back to the Unix command line again. Um, first of all, another little command line routine called echo, which just prints out what you ask it to print out. So I'm going to just use that. That's like print or cat in R. So I'm just going to use that to experiment with some things to see how to do stuff. If I want to loop over a bunch of files in the shell, I write a for loop. So I do for f in star.gen, semicolon do echo dollar f done. So this sets a variable called f to the names of all my files and then I'll just print it out just to check that that's working. So that gives me a loop over the files. What I need to do to create the shape file is to extract part of that file name um, and then put shape, take dot gen off it and put dot shape on it and generally muck around with it. And there's all sorts of hieroglyphics that you can use to manipulate parts of variable names in the shell. Um, so these are called doing text substitutions on those. So in this case, I've extracted out from each file name, I can actually extract out that date in that format, which is quite handy. Um, so in order to be able to do that, we just write a loop like this where we extract out the bits we want run that loop, and then we'll have a shape file for each of our ungenerate files. And one of the things you can do with shell scripts is you can put these things in a file themselves and run them. You don't have to type them in every time. Just put them in a file and run them. So now we've got 38 shape files, which we can load in. But what we really want is one big shape file where the date, instead of being the name of the file, which is hard to get to, that date is an attribute of each feature. We want one shape file where the date is an attribute of each feature, so I can do things like draw the tracks and label them with the date. And to do that, we have to add another field to the attributes of the shapefile. Um, and you can run SQL, structured query language, a database language, on a uh, spatial data set using OGR info. So I'm going to add another column called day, and I can add the date to that field using an update SQL. So if I do those two commands, and now run OGR info to see what I've got here, I've now got a shapefile with a day variable which I added here, which has some values in it in this case, 1st of June 2002. So that's a start. I now want to repeat that for all of these generate files in one big script. So I'm going to loop over all the generate files. I'm going to give myself a little uh, note to say which file I'm processing. I then do some substitutions to work out what this horrible command line is going to look like. This is the command line that generates the shape file. This is the command line that will generate the new field in the table. And then this command line will update that field with the day extracted from the file name. So that block of code there, I can just run in my shell and um, that will produce 38 shapefiles with, with the right field. 
I've now got to merge those shape files, which is another kind of step where you have to start with a um, start with a new one and then kind of add the extra shapes on. I'm kind of speeding over this a bit. And you can write a little script that will merge all those shape files into one big shape file. Um, again, using OGR to OGR. And then when I, I do that, I've now got all tracks.shape. And if I just um, run OGR info on that, see what I've got. And I've now got um, 214 otter tracks. And they've all got their own IDs and they've all got their own day strings. So now I can put them into QGIS. And if I load them in and I look at the attribute table, I've got the ID and the day, and I can color them by month. I can extract parts of this if I want. Um, it's now a nice, clean data set. So that's some of a quick illustration of sort of the power of, of a Unix shell. Um, I use it a lot just for getting simple file information and file properties as, as well as kind of general file handling. The idea of extracting and transforming stuff using things like grep and awk is there for you. Um, the command line geospatial tools are very useful when you get an error message trying to load something into R, for example. You, it will often kind of perhaps highlight the problem slightly more. Okay, that's, that's part one. Um, how long have I got? Till five, yeah? Yeah, okay. Um, if anyone wants to try using Unix tools in Windows, um, there is a thing called msysgit, which I discovered today, which gives you a Unix shell uh, and all sorts of other goodies. But, and apparently this is, this is what the cool kids are using on Windows, is msysgit. There's also a thing called sigwin. Um, and uh, ask me about that later if uh, any of that sounds interesting. So any questions, uh, Tom? Yeah, it's funny how you can use the uh, OGR info command to, to change properties of a, in a data set. That's, I wouldn't expect it there. No, I was surprised that you could run alter and... OGR info can change the OGR, yeah. As long as the output is, is supported, yeah. Well, Arc info could change data. Arc info would change data when you didn't want it to change exactly. data. <laughs> okay, so with these boys covering R so nicely, um, and that I've kind of experimented with using Python for various things. I started using Python for mainly web development, uh, and I've written a lot of web code for, for web servers and things all in Python, and done a bit of spatial work in, in Python. I thought I'd um, try and present some kind of overview of the spatial data handling capabilities in Python. And then I realized that would imply perhaps giving you a lot of starter info on Python anyway. Um, and for me, the, the later part of this section of the talk is, is an exploration. I've not really gone into this much depth because it's a very changing field and it, it's currently changing. There was, I think there's a code sprint on this week, next week, last week to try and in, invalidate some of the stuff I talk about here, which is great because there, there are problems. So um, you've seen this cartoon already um, in slightly edited form. Um, Pythonistas, as they are known, um, are keen to say how wonderful it is and how easy the Python language is. Um, things like, uh, let me risk... Ooh, is it, do I get that shell back with activities? Yes. So if I just run Python, if I just go print hello world... It prints hello world. Woo! You know, it's that easy. Um, whereas in Java, you've got to write a 10 line class file and loads of other nonsense and compile it and then link it with another class file and put it in a file with the right name. So it's Python's a bit like R. 
This is these are these are valid R. This is valid R syntax. X equals one. Y equals four. X times Y. It's four. Oh, no surprises. X plus Y. Five. Yeah, can add up. But but then it, it diverges. Why, why does it have triple? Hmm? Triple, triple, uh, that's the prompt. Oh yeah, that's the prompt. That's the prompt. It's got three of them yeah. because it it's so it so wants you to give some input. Gimme, gimme, gimme. <laughs> I'll make I'll make does with one, you know. But Python wants wants three. It's, I don't know. Why. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, but it, it's don't take that too far. This is constructing a a little list of three elements with square brackets, like using C one two three in R. And if you try and add three to that. I will complain because you're trying to add an integer to a list. So in, in Python, there's none of this explicit um, repetition of, of things to add them up. If you want to add 3 to that list, you say y is 3 plus z for z in x in square brackets. This is called a list comprehension. Um, you end up with y being x plus 3, but you have to kind of spell out the loop inside square brackets. Functions are defined in a similar kind of way as, as in R, instead of, well, almost, except kind of backwards. Um, define a poly function for doing polynomials. Now, in R, this you wouldn't have to do this list comprehension. You could just do y equals a times z x squared plus b times x plus c. But in Python, you've got to spell it out. So y is going to be a times z squared plus b times z plus c for z in x. And return y. So this is sort of vectorized for x. Now, unlike in R, where you often magically find that functions are vectorized for some of your other variables, this is only going to work if you pass it a list of x. If you want to get a polynomial of um, 3, 3x three squared and 4x squared by passing in 3 and 4 there, it won't work. Um, you call these functions just as you would in R kind of thing with named parameters. But you, it's a bit more fussy about the order of parameters and the naming of parameters. Specifically, if you've got a, a function defined with a parameter name, you can't abbreviate that like you can in R. It doesn't match abbreviations. It's slightly stricter. You've got to give the parameter name in full. If you give the parameter name slightly longer, it complains as well. So you've got to get it right. There's no, no two ways about it. Loops in Python are, seem fairly intuitive. Just if I've got a word list, which is just separate individual characters, I can loop over letter in word, print letter. Now that, the most important thing about Python, ooh, is not to panic, is, is the space in between there and there, right? Indentation is significant in Python. It's used to mark out blocks of for loops or if conditions. And people think, white space, why is the white space in my program important? It's important because you should be doing that anyway. If your R code isn't indented nicely, then it looks horrible and it's hard to read which bits are inside the for loop or inside the if. And R lets you indent it in horrible ways. You can indent it so it's counterintuitive to what's actually going on. Whereas Python enforces the indentation to show the structure, um, which is one of the arguments that Pythonistas say for Python being easy to use. Um, so anyway, I type those things in, I indent print letter, I finish my indentation, and it prints out the letters of the word separately like that. And if I want to do nested loops, in this case, what I'm going to do here, I want to print out every pair of letters from my first name, but not the same letter twice, or not in both orders. So I'm kind of doing over the upper triangle of that. And I use the range function to go from naught to n. Python lists kind of start from zero. Um, so I have a nested loop here, which just picks out the two letters a and b in pairs from the name going on like that. Prints them out like that. Now, this is a fairly common pattern of, of 
picking out the diagonal, the upper diagonal from an object, from a matrix of some kind, perhaps. And it would be nice if we could just get rid of all this, all these intermediate variables, i and a. We don't care about i, a and i, b, which are our indices. We only really care about getting pairs of numbers, pairs of, of elements from this vector. So we really want to be able to say for a and b in all the pairs of this word, print a and b. So how would we write this pairs function? We could do that in R by writing a function that looks a bit like this and returns a matrix or a list of some structure with all the elements in. Um, you can do that in Python, but Python has these cool things called generators. i figure out why that's highlighted. Have I selected it? Yeah. Um, you write something that looks like a normal function, but instead of returning a value or constructing a whole list of things to then return back to the caller, it yields something. And what will happen here is that I can now write exactly the thing I wanted to write, the very clean syntax for A and B in pairs of word. It will call pairs, and when it gets to yield, it returns the value of A and B. So the first pair will be returned. But the pairs function knows where it is still. This will then loop around again, and the pairs function will loop the second time. So it kind of stores all its internal state and it doesn't have to construct a big list to return all at once, um, and unless you write this kind of nice clean syntax. It also means that if you've got a generator that's producing numbers that you perhaps don't know when they're going to end, um, you can just uh, write that as a generator, yield, yield the next number until it's run out of numbers, and then the generator can finish, and the loop will finish. And it lets you write very neat structural stuff in, in Python that perhaps is slightly trickier in R. There are kind of iterators in R that can do this kind of stuff, but it's not part of the, of the language, really. R will let you... Sorry, Python. Oh, Python will let you import code from other files, of course. So if I've written a, a file called samples.py with a couple of functions in it, I just do import samples, and now I've got those functions. They're accessed by prepending the name of the file to the name of the function. So this is like loading a package in R, but then the package, the names of the function in the package aren't kind of globally there. They're, they're behind this module identifier. So to run the bar function from samples, I do samples.bar of 99, and it multiplies it by 2. Um, and then if I, if I edit this file, all I have to do is reload samples and the updated definition is included. So that's a kind of very lightweight um, package mechanism that um, is a bit like sourcing an R file back in again to update the uh, definitions. Python has a big uh, standard library of code that you might need. So for example, if you want to know where your current directory is in Full, fully spelt out, you import the operating system module, and then you call operating system.path module, real path of current directory. Uh, it spells it all out, or you can ask it to join a series of names into a valid path. And this handles all the differences between operating systems. So for example, in Windows, there'll be backslashes and C colon and all that stuff. Um, if I want to get some information about the operating system I'm working on, OS.U name will return the operating system, the kernel, and various other bits of stuff. Now, the, this OS.Path thing, um, R has a few functions in, in the base for extracting the directory part and the name part of a file. But last year, um, a guy called um, Richie Cotton wanted a function that just took off the extension. So if he had foo.shape, he wanted to get foo without the dot .shape in R. And he found about three or four of these in various files, in various packages that people had written, totally unrelated to file handling. It was some, you know, one of the biostats modules or one of the um, data handling things. People raster, have in, the raster package has one. The raster package has one. Just, just to take the, the you know, up to the last dot off of a file name. And this, is, this has been implemented several times. And Richie was, was looked at them all, and he said, they all sucked. <laughs> Richie's words, not mine. Um, so he thought, right, well, I'll write one. 
So he wrote uh, a full path handling package called Pathological. Um, so R didn't have a full file name handling package until 2014, even though file names have existed on R since you know, 1994, whatever, and before. And Python's had that from the start, and that seems sensible. That seems right. You, you need to do that. So just in case you wondered what these outputs were from operating system.uname, um, I can just get help of that function, help of os.uname, and the help comes up. It tells me the first one's the sys name, node name, release, version machine, blah, blah, blah. In Python, you can get help from anything, really. In R, you have to give help of the name of the function. In Python, if you give help of some other object, it will work out what that object is and figure out where its help is. So it's, it's kind of easy to find out stuff about things you're working with. So if I just set a quick hello world string there, if I do directory of x, it tells me, and this isn't scrolling because this is Firefox, it tells me, uh, normally this is kind of down the page, all the methods that I can do on a string. So for example, I can test whether a string is uh, lowercase, whether it's digits, and so on. So then I can do stuff like x.title, which returns title case. It's capitalized the first two letters. Upper will give me an uppercase. Split returns the thing split into words. So I can do help of x.split. Now x is my character thing. Um, and that tells me about the split method. Um, so every character string you ever make in Python, you can easily get to the help on its method. And Python is an object-oriented language at heart, so um, I've talked about objects and methods, and sometimes the method will change the object it runs on. So, for example, if I have z as a list of numbers and I run the sort method, I get back a z which has changed. It's modified z. That's hard to do in, in R without reference classes or environments, because mostly R is a more purely functional language where you'd have to do z equals sort of z. And Python methods can actually do both. They can actually modify and return a value. So if I do last year z.pop, it takes the last element of z by popping it off the end of z. So z is now slightly shorter. And it's a fairly common pattern to just keep popping until you end up with nothing in z and you've processed all of z. So let's uh, go a bit more complicated. I might have to really speed up, surely, unless no one wants to eat pizza. This is how you define a cl new class of objects in Python. This is a simple class which is just going to store an x and y coordinate pair so I can throw points around. And you have an initialization method and then I've, I've, which bundles the coordinates up in, a, in the object. I've written a method that returns a coordinate pair and I've written another method here which shows how to modify the object itself just by adding an offset. So I can then create a new point at some random location. I can get its x-coordinate as a number. I can get its coordinates as a pair. If I run the shift function with an x and y shift, I've now modified p so that its coordinates are now 1,000, 2,000 further away than it was. So I've now got a class of object I can use for handling coordinates. I want to do some math on these coordinates. Python has a standard mathematics library called math. If it was written by an Englishman, it'd be called maths. Uh, here's a little function which uses the square root function from the math library to just work out the Pythagorean distance between two of my point objects. And just so I can test it, the Pythagorean distance between 0, 0 and 3, 4, as the Egyptians can tell you, was 5. Otherwise, the pyramids would be wonky. So let's, let's carry on looking at distances on, on, on the Earth. Um, I did a quick search for the formula for spherical distance because I'm lazy and someone had already implemented a nice spherical distance function in Python, which I got from GitHub. <coughs> it depends on you telling it the Earth radius. I'm going to make a couple of, couple of points and then I'm going to define this great circle distance function which does all the math. There's lots of math.cos, math.sign and returns a distance. 
just basically working on a unit sphere and multiplying by the Earth radius. And so then I can just call great circle distance between the two elements of my points, and I get 83.32 meters. But we know the Earth isn't spherical, so how do you do that on an elliptical surface? You go to Wikipedia and you discover part one of the Vincenti formula for distances on ellipses, all this, so you can implement all this in Python if you want. That's part one. Part two involves recomputing something else and iteratively working out an error term and then modifying it and then looping over that. And you could implement all that in Python if you want, but I'm lazy, so I thought there's got to be something better. If you wanted to implement any of that, what you would probably do is start using the numerical Python library called NumPy, which everyone seems to import as NP. You don't have to keep typing NumPy all the time. You can import the NumPy library as, as something else with an alias. So and then instead of having to do these list comprehensions to work out uh, functions of vectors, you can use numpy.sign to actually do that all in one. And it returns an array. So numpy has these array classes for storing one-dimensional and two-dimensional data. And you can you also get some statistics functions. So I can generate 20 plus on random numbers um, with mean 10. Or is that 10 random numbers with mean 20? No, it's 20 with mean 10 in an array like that. And just to show you the matrix operations, I can create a simple two by two numpy matrix. One, two, three, four. Create its, and then I can do matrix products, I can do matrix transposes, and I can even get the matrix inverse with m dot i, and I can prove it's the inverse by multiplying it and showing I don't get an identity matrix, because there's always a numeric uh, RFAC 7.31 compatible uh, number there. How many people understand the reference to RFAC 7.31? This is a, a frequently asked question on the R mailing list, um, which is, why aren't these two numbers equal? And it's because of numerical precision when dealing with floating point numbers. So often people will just say, oh, thanks, 7.31 on the mailing list. So now we've, we've got numerical Python. Let's see how we're going to compute this elliptical distance. Well, we're not. We're going to use a module called GeoPy, which you can install, open source, free, etc. We can import their great circle function, which is a spherical, and I can compute the distance between my two points again. And when I call that great circle function, I get d, which is a distance object. So I can then get, OK, tell me about that d. What, help me on that d thing. What is that d thing? And it tells me it's all a great circle distance thing. Um, and it tells me all the things I can do with that object. and down here, you can see that I can actually get that distance returned already converted into whatever units I want. So I can see it's 83.25 meters, 273.14 feet. Um, I can modify the Earth radius if I want to use a different sized Earth. Um, and now I'm comparing my my great circle distance function with theirs, and it's slightly different, even with the same radius. So they're doing something slightly different in their calculation. Hopefully, it should be important. The GeoPy package includes this elliptical distance function, so I can compare their great circle distance with their elliptical function without having to write any code, which is great. GeoPy also has a geocoding um, function, so I can figure out the distance between where I live in Lancaster. I lied, I don't really live in a Unix shell. Uh, I live in Lancaster, UK. If you just put Lancaster, it gives you the one in Pennsylvania for some reason, which I think was named after the original one. And um, where I currently am now in Bergen, so I can see that I am 532.786 miles from home, or 857.436 kilometers. So geocoding is all nice. This is where spatial stuff in Python lags a lot behind R, and I kind of, I think I said something on Twitter that. It was about eight, eight, years, eight years behind R at the moment. Uh, in the, there's, there's a lack of unification of, of data handling things and a lot of libraries with missing features. Fiona, I don't know why it's named Fiona apart from the fact that it's got I-O in it for input-output. Uh, maybe it's the author's girlfriend, don't know. Um, 
It's not the author. The author is um, Sean. Sean Gillies. Um, the, well, I mean, I don't know whether it's related to his other package called... Um, no, hang on. Well, he's written. He's got Fiona and Shapely. I don't know whether that's a comment on Fiona. I, <laughs> I don't know. But this is a package for reading OGR data. So I can just import the Fiona module, open a shape file for reading, and then I can get the metadata, the coordinate system, the bounding box, features, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I can get the schema of the data. So I know that this is a map of England, and it's got perimeter and admin area names and various other codes and what country it's in uh, for each of those. But I can't plot it yet. <clears throat> I can loop over the features within that object and I can eventually drill down into the geometry. So this is sort of the equivalent of Roger's big table of rings and polygons and linear features and stuff. So I can, I can get down to all of that um, from what I've read into Fiona. Okay, so this is uh, Shapely, which is package written by the same guy for doing geometry manipulations. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm going to read in a a file, and I'm just going to generate a 10 kilometer buffer around it. So I'm going to write that within a Python function, which takes an input, an output, and a width. I open my input file. I define a schema, which is the attributes of the output file and what geometry it's got. Create a new output file. And then I loop over the input features. And then down here is where I get the geometry of the input feature. Uh, turn it into a shapely object, and then create a buffer of that given width, and then I can just do this at the Python command line. I can't plot that yet. But if I put that in a file called buffering.py, that's the buffer function there. This is a nice little feature of Python, is you can easily convert functions into command line scripts. If you put this little bit of magic into a file, a Python file, if double underscore name equals double underscore main, then if you just run that Python with that file name, it skips all this. Well, it didn't skip all that, but it will keep going until it hits this. And it goes, ah, you think I'm, you want me to be a command line? OK, I'll get the arguments and I'll call this function. So if I put that in a, a file like that, then I can just type python buffering.py england.shape buffer.shape 10,000 on the command line and it will generate my 10 kilometer buffer around England. Or I can reuse this buffer function from another Python file. So I've already written a reusable piece of Python code there, which is nice. And I can go back to my Unix skills. If I want to generate buffers at 10, 20, 30, and 40 kilometers by writing a little loop like that and calling my buffering function, and that will give me four buffers. Or I can write a loop in Python, which imports the function from that Python script and does the same thing. Either way, it's all very neat. Um, I still can't plot anything. Okay. Um, this little guy. This this is a. Do you recognise this animal? It's a panda. Yeah, it's a it's a red panda, carrying the earth. Um, it's a geo panda. Obviously, um, geo pandas are. Are like spatial polygons or spatial data frames. Pandas are the Python equivalent of data frames, and some people have, have put spatial columns onto these things and called them geopandas. So you can, once you've got the module installed, you can then do geopanda.read file of a shape file, and then you've got something that looks like a spatial polygons data frame. It's got the attributes all there very nicely. It's got the geometry in a column very nicely, and you can dice and slice these things the same way as you can data frames. And it's got a plot method. Okay, You load in the standard sort of plotting, Python plotting thing, and then you can just do africa.plot of a column, and I get a plot, I get a map. Um, I can plot it with a categorical column and get a legend as well. You can't get a legend for the continuous data at the moment, but I think that's what the guys are working on at this code sprint. Geopandas also uses the Shapely code for doing buffers and intersections and stuff like that. So within a few lines, I can take this map of all the regions, I can merge all the regions and do a buffer. 
and I can plot it. Great. But a lot of the um, work on graphics in Python these days is focusing on JavaScript and targeting web pages in HTML. So there's a couple of packages for generating web page maps, which I, I discovered. Uh, well, discovered in the same way that Columbus discovered uh, North America. Um, there's MPL leaflet, which interfaces with um, the leaflet uh, web mapping, and Folium, which I think also uses leaflet. Um, so it's quite simple. In, in just a few lines, you can get MPL leaflet to generate an HTML file and put it in your browser. And that comes up. Oh, this is the one. This is the Folium one. The, 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 I think the colors and everything can be tweaked, and the, the, the bar looks the color choice is a bit strange. It might be some kind of um, equal values. I don't know. But this is a web map. This is a slippy map that I can drag around and zoom in, just done in a few lines. And the other package, MPL Leaflet, does pretty essentially the same thing. And the other big thing in Python at the moment is a thing called Python Notebooks, which is where you've got a web browser with bits of Python code and the output, a bit of Python code, the output. And you can do this all interactively and generate a notebook, which you can then save and other people can load in and play with. And you can embed these maps into Python Notebooks. So here's a little chunk of notebook script, and when you kind of run that in your notebook, it produces the map. But there's a slight problem with the, with the overlay. It's a, a style sheet problem, and, and it's kind of a known problem. It's not been fixed. So I kind of looked at that and thought, I haven't really got time to deal with this. So I gave up on that. But Python notebooks are very cool, and a lot of people are raving about them. Um, Is what? Uh, Python, notebook. Python Notebook is running Python as a web server, a web service, and a client running as JavaScript on your browser that connects to that service. Okay, but, so, but can it be on your machine or it has to be on the server? It can be, on your, it can be local or it can be remote. Because right. if you want to share it, it has to be on the server. Yeah. And so if somebody changes the code, it gets this different output. Yep. Okay. Right. Um, there are some spatial analysis um, packages in Python. There's PySAL, which can do things like these local uh, indicators of correlation. Is that the right? No, local indicators of spatial association. Spatial association. Um, Moran indexes, Geary indexes, stuff like that. Um, so you can do that from PySAL. So essentially, this is saying, what's the value of my quantity in this region? How does it compare with my neighbours? This kind of stuff. So, uh, am I very sim? Have I got a very similar mortality rate to all my neighbours, or am I very different to all my neighbours? This kind of local correlation structure stuff, and you can compute those in Python using PySAL, and then you can add them onto your uh, GeoPandas and plot them, and get maps which look a bit like the ones in um, the ASDAR book. Uh, and it does also the smoothing, like the empirical base stuff, and it does spatial regression. It doesn't really have any graphics or any summaries or very good documentation. And that's fairly common with a lot of this spatial stuff that I kind of discovered in in uh, Python. So got to fill in the gaps somehow. And this is where my no R way falls apart. There is a a nice package, Python package called RPy2, which lets you call R code in a very simple way. I'm just going to import Roger's spdep package into Python and then call functions in the spdep fun package with my Python data objects. Um, in this case, I'm going to compute the local Moran index, the same thing as I just computed in PySAL, using the data as a bit of conversion that needs doing from my GeoPanda. And then I can use Python's histogramming plot to get a plot of what those um, Z's, Z values from that Miranda X look like. So you can use RPy to use R to fill in the gaps and use Python for some of the other good stuff. So quick zoom of interesting things 
from that. Maybe you'll take one or two of these away from you. At least know that they exist. You might want to look into Python. IPython notebooks are pretty cool. I've not really, I've only scratched the surface on that. There's NumPy for doing numerical things when you kind of do a lot of numerical stuff. There's SciPy, which has got all sorts of scientific functions in. Um, Shapely Fiona and lately Raster.io for doing raster reading. Geopandas for spatial data and there's developments going on there. There seems to be this PySAL thing for doing spatial stats. If you're doing MCMC calculations and you're using bugs or WinBugs or OpenBugs or STAN or something like that, there's PyMC for doing Markov chain Monte Carlo stuff. Lots of machine learning stuff. Lots of the machine learning guys are writing stuff in Python. Um, the scikit-learn has got lots of machine learning algorithms implemented. But if all else fails and the only implementation is in, is in R, then you can use RPy2. So those are my kind of takeaways for that. Whew, and I forgot what part three is now, so I'm going to have to think. Any questions on on that last? It's probably gone out the windows and. What, such as? <laughs> well, I don't know. So, so obviously, you, just, you can barely mimic what we can do in R. So, what, so where have you, you can barely take the, f the extension of a file name in R. So, um. <laughs> yeah, like, let's talk about the spatial. I mean, I, I think there are clear use cases. You know, cases where you say, well, here's Python would be a nice way to go. Is that, that the what? Any, any insight there? I, I, I'm thinking. I'm seeing stuff being implemented in Python that's not being implemented in R. There's, there's some guys at Liverpool University who are doing some sort of big data, two-dimensional Gaussian process stuff, and they're doing it exclusively in Python. And if I want to use their techniques to, to fit Gaussian processes for 200,000 points, which is what they do, and it takes them three seconds, you know, I, I'm going to use their code. I'm not going to try and implement that in R or or, or whatever. So um well, if the R people would use inline, right? Yeah, but that's it's not real. It doesn't that doesn't work. But that's a very specific Sorry, question. Uh, I was working with our pattern with a pattern raster in R, but my process took like thirty two hours and they recommend me to change to Python because I can't recall the I I um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think someone's talking about the state of multi-processing in, in R and are they? Isn't that on the agenda at some point? But um, tomorrow. Uh, Oh, uh, no, I'd use R. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, obviously, there's an overlap and there's, there's differences. But the, the wrong idea is that, you know, you have to choose between one of the other. That's nonsense. And then you see you can you can go from Python and call things from R, and you can go in R and call things from Python. So, but you have to just learn how to make these bridges. That's it. And they are, obviously, they, they, they are both open source communities. They're not like Google or Microsoft or something. You mm. know, they will, uh, you know, these big companies, they make, uh, um, 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 how do you say, uh, traps for each other, right? And it's all hidden. But the open source uh, software, they don't make traps for each other. What about the graphics capabilities? You showed a few plots, but is that, sort of, is that, a, is that a strength or is it sort of a, a backyard? I'm, I'm not an, sure. I'm no expert. I really am no expert because I've I've used R for so long, and I'm really a newbie to Python, which is why I'm slightly worried about standing here and talking about it. Um, and I'm sure there are Python experts who could come along who've got five years of using it nonstop who can do groovy things. I mean, it took me a lot to get those plots. <laughs> really, newbie. Python capability. 
Yeah, I mean, someone is trying to write a ggplot function for Python, um, page for Python. So, and I've seen some pretty pictures of, that they've made, but yeah, I was, God, yeah, your hand has been. Yeah, well, one of the things that I first thought when I was looking at this code that these Liverpool guys were doing is, because my plotting skills were so rubbish in Python, was, right, the first thing I want to do is how do I get their data out into R so I can plot it and graph it? Okay, can I, can I get on? Oh, you, you yeah, I've got another half hour. That's part two finished. <laughs> this, this one will be quick. He lied. Okay, um, I want to talk about QGIS because I, I, um, I am the proud owner of it. QGIS baseball cap, which was given to me by the, the by Gary Sherman himself, who uh, started the project. And QGIS is now the the open source desktop JS saga. People may debate. We'll fight about that later. I think <laughs> um, it's cross-platform. It runs on Linux, Windows, Macs. It works with all the geospatial standards we've talked about. It's mostly written in C++, but it has an embedded Python. There's a typical screen, map on the right, layers on the left, menus at the top, buttons everywhere. All configurable, you can move the buttons around wherever you like. Um, this is using an open street map background, which is easy to just put as an extra layer. It has a, a map composer, which lets you draw, construct these pretty maps. One of the things we might do in the workshop for me on Thursday is let's make some pretty maps. Let's focus on cartography. Let's make Let's see if any of you you've got data that we can make into a pretty map like this using QGIS, and then perhaps we can present them on the on the Friday. We could have a little gallery in here or something of of pretty maps because uh, prettiness is important. Um, so it's written in C plus plus. The code is all developed on GitHub, so it's all open. You can follow the development track of any particular file you like. There's a wonderful visualization of the development process produced by this tool which views the developers as little flies zooming around, firing code into this tree which represents the code. It's, it's quite amazing. You can see when there's a code sprint and suddenly... Amazing. The, the documentation is all automatically generated from the code, which is pretty great. So you can find out how everything is constructed. So a feature, so a, a geographic feature, like a particular polygon or a point or something, you can tell that it's composed of a geometry type object and a field type object. Um, so that's a feature, that's a fairly simple structure. You get onto more complicated things like a layer. So this is the representation of a layer. It's got a coordinate reference system, it's got features, it's got relations to various other objects around the place. And all this documentation is online. The important thing if you want to write code that interfaces with QGIS is to look at the methods. So these are the methods that you can have on a a feature, so for example, you can get the fields, what the, um, the data for it, and the geometry you can get using the various methods. You can change the geometry, set the geometry, so on and so forth. This is all the C++ programmers thing. For the Python programmer, you can bring up a Python console, which gives you the familiar now Python prompt, and you can type code in there. For example, you can get a layer from your index of layers, 
and you can loop over all the features and get the geometry and print the geometry out, print the bounding box, with the various methods of the geometry. So you don't have to keep typing it. You've pretty much got an integrated development environment where you can open a file over here, type the things in, and load it into here, the usual search and replace nonsense in there. So here I'm actually printing out the geometry of each of my features as well-known text. So it's this, this polygon um, with the coordinates in it. So I've got a little case study that I wanted to do, which is, um, again, fictional. Again, involves cute animals. I didn't show any pictures of sea otters. I should, should have done that. This time, uh, sorry? Red and, red and grey squirrels. Um, the guys on the left, the red squirrels are the nice ones. They're the English, British red squirrels who have been driven out by the American grey squirrel in the last couple hundred years. So it's important we protect these guys and important that we run these over. Um, this is a great sign. Red squirrels, drive slowly. <laughs> I, th I think they get graffitied with steering wheels. So. <laughs> Have you seen any grey squirrels in the area? So there is, there is a red squirrel group not far from where I live. And if you see a grey squirrel, you ring up Bernard or Rosemary or Mal, and say, there's a grey squirrel, and they come around. <laughs> So let's have a little fictional uh, scenario. I've got an area where the red squirrels are, an area where the greys are, or two areas. And what I want to do is, if the populations were to triple and the areas were to triple, are these two species going to start overlapping? Now, QGIS has a whole toolbox, including grass functions, um, Saga GIS functions, all integrated within it. And it's got its own little set of buffers functions. So you can draw a fixed distance buffer around each region if you want and see if they overlap. But that's a fixed distance buffer. That's not scaling the area up. Um, we want to find a buffer width that scales the area. And since the area of a buffer region strictly increases as the width, the buffer width increases, we can do a binary search algorithm until we found a buffer that multiplies the area by three. Um, and we can integrate that with QGIS quite easily. We write a single Python file which has a little header on here which defines the inputs and outputs. We import the sort of boilerplate kind of stuff from the QGIS processing thing. We input my rescale buffer function, which I haven't written yet here. And then I just loop over all my features, my input features. I compute the scale buffer, and I add that to an output. And if I just create that one file, I get a little user interface on my little analysis menu, which lets me choose the input regions, the scale factor that I want to multiply the scale up, and the output that I want to send it. And so that gives me that. So those dotted lines now are triple the area of the enclosed solid areas. So now I can see that there's a sort of conflict area here where they overlap. How do I do that analytically within QGIS? Um, the way I found was to split this one layer onto attributes. I've now got two layers. And then I can do the intersection of those two separate layers. Um, I can automate that with another script. So I've got another little header for inputs and outputs. I'm now looping over all pairs of features. And in this case, what I do is I only consider the intersection of the features if the owner variable, which in this case is the species of squirrel, is different. So if, as I loop over the pairs of features. If it's a grey squirrel area with a grey squirrel area, I don't worry about it. If it's a grey squirrel area with a red squirrel area, I compute the intersection. There may or may not be an intersection, but that's just done with the intersects function. And then if there's an intersection, I write out the intersection. And I get a nice, easy to use dialog, which I can then run. <coughs> so that's a kind of two-step process. First of all, I triple the areas, and then I run the uh, conflict algorithm. But I can, I can combine those because QGIS has this rather groovy little model builder where you can graphically build an algorithm using any of the QGIS processing algorithms with any of your inputs and outputs. So in this case, um, the blue things are the inputs, the white boxes are the algorithms, and the pale blue box is the output. And you can drag and drop these models, and they work with raster data as well. So if you've got some kind of raster processing chain where you clip this and then multiply that by five and compute this, you can build these models in QGIS. And once that's done, you get another nice little user interface that this time gives me the inputs 
for that model. So in this case, I've got my squirrels region. I have to tell it which variable in my regions identifies the species that I'm testing for conflict. I give it how much I want to increase the region, and it gives me an output to choose. I run that, and I will get another layer with the conflict region in, which I can color in a nice dramatic red, red dashed lines. So that's built a, a simple user interface for people to run a fairly complicated algorithm in one step. So that was actually in 10 minutes. That was pretty good. <laughs> um, the, the interaction of QGIS with Python extends to beyond writing these little processing scripts to writing full-on plugins, um, which can do things like build completely customized user interfaces with buttons and sliders and controls. Uh, you can add things to the menu at the top. Uh, you can create different types of layer beyond the vector and raster. And in fact, the, that open layers, open street map background is a new layer type, which these guys have invented. You can define new renderers, which are ways of displaying mapping from, in ggplot terms, aesthetics to whatever a color or whatever is called in ggplot uh, output. So you could, for example, define a renderer that took a number of cases and a number of controls and colored the point or the area based on the ratio of cases to controls kind of automatically. Um, and I did some of these things for a, a project for a much earlier version of QGIS where we were looking at uh, exactly that, with cases and controls of disease and we wanted to map them nicely. Again, I'm, I'm deviating from my no R way here and the guys are going to go, why don't you just do everything in R? These you can build kind of R versions of these scripts. Let's get back to one. There's an R processing module. You give it the same kind of header like this, but instead of having to write Python code, you can write R code. And the layers in your QGIS map get magically converted into spatial polygons data frames, which you can then play with in R, and then output, create a new spatial polygons data frame, which gets turned into a new layer on your QGIS map. So you can write really neat plugins in R, uh, which I haven't done, but you can do it. And there are some examples included in QGIS for doing that. I use QGIS a lot for simple exploratory mapping when I get a data set. So stuff like the hypothetical um, sea otter tracks, I'd load that into QGIS before I loaded it into R because I can you know, drag the map around and zoom in and it's much easier to create different colorings for features and things like that. And also, it's got a full editing and cleanup facility. So I can actually go in and move vertices around. I can create new polygons interactively or new points, change the, the attributes. I can get a spreadsheet out of the attributes and just edit them interactively. It's got an expression engine where I can create new attributes or I can map based on you know, produce colors based on attributes of the data and so on. It, uh, it has all the standards. It talks to spatial databases and it can consume and produce uh, OGC services. So I can, I can even serve out my QGIS projects as web services to other people quite easily. It's all good stuff. Um, as I say, what I might do, I'm, I'm happy to take votes on what people want to do uh, on Thursday, because I've got very little planned for Thursday workshop, because uh, I don't know who we've got here, what you want to do. But if you want to chat to me and say you think maybe producing pretty maps in QGIS is a good idea, or if you want to figure out any of the other stuff I've talked about at speed, a bit slower, then um, I'm happy to take chat on that and uh, let me know. So. That's my very quick advanced QGIS. Okay. So you have time till Thursday, so... Uh, I have time till, yeah, yeah. for that. Okay, so th thanks for your time. Okay. Thank you.